surfaced first in my brain was the word anxiety, as in anxiety about what I would want to talk about. Um, and then, I don't know why exactly, but I started ruminating over the phrase um, separation anxiety, that familiar concept, I think, to all of us. Uh, and, um, and then I was ruminating about, uh, or really more like freaking out about Brexit, uh, and uh, uh, more generally, over time, Donald Trump, and, um, and realizing that uh, what seems to be going on is, um, is the opposite of separation anxiety, but it's more like a closeness anxiety, or maybe integration anxiety, but the idea that we're so uncomfortable with uh, people who are different from us uh, being close to us, uh, that we have to do something uh, to push them away, um, and that that just seems to be surfacing everywhere uh, right now. Uh, so I'll talk a bit about uh, the campus context, and so what Donna was just saying about the intersections, you know, that this is happening across all kinds of intergroup relations, gender identity and sexuality, uh, race, religion, nationality, uh, uh, positions of power, professor versus student, all, all of these kinds of uh, um, power dynamics uh, uh, seem to come back to this uh, a tremendous anxiety that, uh, that we have uh, in our cultures uh, uh, around closeness. And, um, uh, and so what that leads to is uh, instead of separation anxiety, I reversed it in my circuitous brain, uh, to anxiety separation. So in response to closeness, uh, anxiety, we anxiously separate from people, right? It's an anxiety-driven pushing away of people. And so on campuses, uh, that translates uh, primarily into two, uh, two uh, fixes. Um, the one, uh, the, the lesser one, is the uh, fairly ubiquitous no contact order which means that if you have a problem with somebody else or they harmed you in some way, we'll set up a no contact order uh, so that even though you're in the same community and often in very same spaces like the same dining hall or gym or even class, uh, you're not allowed to talk to each other or communicate in any, in any way. Um, and then of course there's suspension and expulsion and other pushing away. Um, so that's what we do. And what I wanted to, um, talk about is, uh, um, by way of example, is a kind of before and after experience that I had um, way back when, when we started our restorative justice program at Skidmore College. And at that time, and this is like 15 years ago, so I can't, I, I don't have time to tell you the full stories, and I can't tell you the full stories because they're so long ago, I don't really remember all the details. Um, uh, at that time, I was um, working uh, pretty closely and learning from uh, the good people of Vermont, many of them are here in this room, uh, studying their uh, restored, newly rolled out restorative justice program. And, uh, and while I was doing that, there was a bit of an uproar on our campus about our judicial process, disciplinary process, and the uh, dissatisfaction students had with it. So I got enlisted into a committee to look at our process and consider alternatives. So the timing was fortuitous because I could say, let's do what Vermont does. And people said, what's that? And I said, here it is. And they said, OK. So we, we started our program uh, uh, just on the, essentially on that basis. Uh, and so what I had a chance uh, to experience at that time was a case right before we uh, started our restorative justice process and then a case uh, just after. Um, and they were nearly identical. Uh, so the contrast is, um, uh, is pronounced. Uh, in, um, in both of these cases, uh, they began with a drunk male student, as often campus misconduct uh, begins. Uh, and in both of these cases, uh, that male student had uh, lost their key to get back into their dorm, their residence hall, and, uh, and both chose the same solution, which was to climb in through a first floor window of somebody else's room so they could get back in, uh, not necessarily knowing whose room that was. And in both of those cases, and this is two in the morning or so, uh, was a, a single female student, uh, in the first case, 
asleep in her bed, uh, woken up by uh, this intruder who's just climbed, male intruder who's just climbed in through her window. Um, so in this first case, uh, we went through a disciplinary hearing to address this kind of breaking and entering situation. And, uh, and the harmed party had no real role to play except that like in a criminal justice process, uh, being a witness to the crime uh, and uh, giving only testimony for a short portion of what happened and leaving and never hearing uh, the guy's perspective or understanding of what, what was behind uh, his decision to do that. Um, and then he was uh, justly punished, found in violation of the policy uh, and given a set of sanctions, like again, I can't remember all of them. Uh, the one that uh, uh, stands out in my memory was this no contact order. He's not allowed to get in touch with her in any way. Uh, they can't communicate. And, uh, and then the fallout from that, the, the, the one major lasting impact of that was that she uh, remained uh, fearful so that's that closeness anxiety perpetuated. Uh, and he uh, remained or, or uh, became resentful, uh, particularly resentful of her for getting him into trouble. In other words, hey, this was no big deal. I was just trying to get to my room. I didn't have any malintent. Why is everybody making a big deal about this? Um, so she, her anxiety goes up because she knows he's mad through the grapevine that he's mad at her, right? So uh, just an all-around uh, a, a technically successful case with very, very unsuccessful outcomes. We have nearly the same case a year later when we start our restorative justice program. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, in this case, the guy climbs through the window just as uh, the young woman has come back into her room after taking a shower. So she has a towel wrapped around her. He's coming in one way, she's coming in the other. He, in fact, kind of barrels over her to get out the door. Uh, and it, when she screams, he's, he screams, he goes through. So in, there's physical contact in this one. So it's in some ways even worse. Um, and so we did the thing that we do in restorative justice. And I love the line I've heard uh, Lauren Abramson repeating. She's, uh, I think she's out of the room at this particular moment, but you can um, pat her on the back uh, for this good line. Um, uh, she says, in restorative justice, uh, we do a radical thing. We let people talk to each other. Uh, and that's what we did. Uh, we let them talk to each other, and we created a space in, in which this young woman could talk about how frightened uh, she was, uh, and uh, uh, um, he could talk about what was behind uh, his uh, decision making in the moment. There was some mutual reinsurance around uh, you know, uh, safety and so forth. And, um, uh, and there were three in 20 second intervals, um, key moments that came out of this before I close. Uh, three discussions that happened that I think were important. One was uh, uh, an exploration of why her fear was not an overreaction, which was the starting place for both of these guys. Uh, and, um, and that by having this conversation rather than suspending him from uh, residential living or something like that, um, we were able to explore that topic, uh, which meant the larger topic around rape culture, around campus sexual assault. And out of that, the two of them actually wanted to collaborate on a, a residence hall education program around the prevalence of campus sexual assault. So they wanted to work together on that. The second was the question, why, um, why do we have to be so drunk? Why is it that uh, students feel like they must get so drunk to have fun? Uh, and so we posed the challenge to him, um, could you organize a, a so, an alcohol-free social event on campus that you and your friends would actually want to go to. And that was a really creative challenge for this guy, <laughs> uh, which he wanted to take up because it was intriguing. It was almost inconceivable. Uh, so uh, so we, could, we could have a conversation about campus drinking and its implications. Uh, and then the third uh, discussion that we had was, why is it so easy to climb into first floor windows? 
And that raised the question of institutional uh, or community responsibility that goes beyond the individual responsibility that the particular uh, student uh, and that there is more involved in this. So when we start to talk about the uh, systemic or structural implications of the, or systems within which uh, students and others operate. And, uh, and so then there was a plan that was made to actually make it harder to climb into first floor windows. Uh, so there was some structural, literally structural change uh, that came out of this. So what uh, all of this is to say is that um, changing campus climate and culture it doesn't happen through one individual case, but what happens is you start to engage in questions and discussions and activities that uh, over time start to really address the larger issues instead of just driving uh, people apart. Okay, thank you.